following interview was conducted with Thomas A. Trackman, current president of Iron Key for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March 28, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Thomas, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, tell us a little about where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Sure. I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, and that's where I spent the, spent the majority of my childhood as well. Uh, going to Carmel High School before eventually coming to Purdue. Uh, I have one older sister who currently resides in Indianapolis and is a lawyer there. Uh, both my parents are actually from West Lafayette, so that kind of gave me an instant connection to Purdue and the university. Um, and both my grandfathers, their respective parents, were professors at the university. So I uh, always had a strong connection to Purdue. Um, when it came time to make a college decision, I kind of weighed... Um, athletics and tuition in that I was planning on playing college soccer somewhere uh, but that didn't work out so then the tuition financially made the most sense for me to stay to an, at an in-state school and between the connection to the university with my family and simply enjoying Purdue much more than the other in-state schools uh, <laughs> it was an easy easy when decision for me. When your parents lived here was he affiliated with the university or my your parent your parents lived in West Lafayette? They, they, they did they currently live in Indianapolis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell us a little about high school and uh, gather soccer is kind of so athletics would be something to share. With sure, us. yeah. Uh, I played competitive soccer all through basically my entire life. That was sort of my my, my passion, my, my major activity in high school. Uh, that's where I spent the majority of my time. I was able to travel around a fair amount through that. In addition to that, I did a lot of business organizations and business competitions in high school. So what got, did they entail? What sort of competitions were they? Sure. So they were, uh, it varied a little bit, but it was mainly through an organization called DECA in which you would, you would basically, you'd basically team up with a partner and be given a short business case and give, you'd be given an X amount of time to recommend a solution for that case and give a presentation. We were able to do that and do very well in those competitions. And then my senior year also through the same organization was allowed to sort of do a co-op work program and I could leave school early each day and go work. So I worked for the Carmel Chamber of Commerce, local Chamber of Commerce, and was, that's where I first kind of got business experience and that helped tailor my Purdue career as well then knowing a little bit more of what I wanted to do when I came. Super. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell us about Purdue. Did you come from Boiler Gold Rush? I did. Okay. I did do Boiler Gold Rush. Okay. Um, I'll admit I'm not. I was not one of the more active students in Boiler Gold Rush. I think there's a lot of them going I, on. You know, having grandparents who are professors, I knew a lot of the university. What's your, your grandfather? What uh, department was he in? Sure. One was a uh, microbiologist. Okay. Um, so he he are was all. Still alive? Are they still uh, one, one is alive. and One has passed away. Um, okay. Ed Umbarger was one grandfather. He was a microbiologist, and then Leon Trackman was the other, and he was a. Worked in various roles within the liberal arts, school of liberal arts, teaching history and English, and then also some administrative roles and interim dean at one point in time as well. So, okay. uh, yeah, good. successful career. Good. What, what is your major? Talk a little bit about that. And then, are you, did you play? Are you playing soccer as well? Sure. I, I wish I was playing soccer still, but only in intramurals for okay. for my fraternity. Nothing nothing too serious. Um, education. Uh, I was able to do a pretty unique program to Purdue in that. I originally came to the university uh, with an undeclared major. I was debating whether to do business, which I really enjoyed and interested me in high school, or history. And I, I always loved history as well and thought I could become a history professor someday. So I came, under, came as an undeclared major and I quickly switched to, man, to, to the business school, Craner, for a management degree, just kind of realizing that that may be where my best future is. Um, and was able to do well enough academically and on campus as well to be admitted into Cranert's 3 plus 2 program, which essentially lets a handful of students graduate in three years and then begin their MBA for the following two. So it's my fifth year at the university now, but I'm a second year graduate student. Um, it is it is sort of unique being a graduate student now in that the average age of my classmates are 28, and just our priorities are a little bit different when I you know, go home to a fraternity house or go home to you know, essentially no true responsibilities when others go home to two or three little kids running around needing to be fed and taken care of and that sort of thing. So it's been an interesting two years, but very glad I did the program. Very glad I was allowed to do the program and uh, I've learned a lot. How many students are in the same program with you? Is there a limit on how many? It, there, there's, not, there's not a set limit. I would okay. say probably six. Oh, okay. I think there's 
Well, there's four or five from the there's five or, there's yeah I think there's five including me from the school management and then two or three engineers that were allowed to do a very similar program. All right. Okay. Um, now let's talk a little bit about you know Iron Key. Tell sure. the researchers what type of organization, and then your year as president. Uh, sure. What you've been going, what's been going on? Absolutely. Uh, and how did you tell how you get into it or what the membership is comprised of? No problem. So what Iron Key is, Iron Key is a student honor society in which uh, essentially distinguishes what the university considers the 12 best senior leaders. And the group was established in 1911, so this is the 100th class of Iron Key, so that's another honor to be a part of that class and that history. And the group was, as I mentioned, designed to honor student leaders and really started off as the, the university president's advisory council. So if President Cordova, whoever the president was at that time, needs student advice on any subject, you can tap a large resource of student leaders who have involvement in different parts of the Purdue community and are just well connected within the university so you can really find out what's on the students' minds. Uh, over time, that role has changed somewhat. And while there is some, still some advisory council role to the, the president, to the, president, to the sure. university president, there's now a large, large component on doing some project to improve Purdue's community, to improve the campus. So a few examples of that pro- of those projects are the Purdue Block P was an Iron Key project, the Flags in the Union were an Iron Key project. Um, there's been a new, there's a new television monitor outside of Witherall Hall um, that came about after, after you could no longer flyer for student organizations on the sidewalk. And there's there's a couple other ones, obviously. Those are some of the more prominent ones, which are physical structures. There's others that are more service-based and will help students ease their, ease their transition to Purdue and better become acclimated with the university. So our, the majority of our focus has been working on our project for the year. Does the, the student, the group, comes up with the project? Yes, the group completely comes up with the project. Um, that's what that was the large I'd say the majority of our time was spent trying to determine what our project should be how we'll improve the community how we'll make it how we'll make the university a better place than we arrived here four years ago and that's a challenge it was a challenge it was a challenge Um, and that was you mentioned a little bit with the leadership and president Rob Iron Key and that's the one leadership challenge I faced through or the true challenge I faced through that as we did receive all kinds of ideas and some of them would be realistic, some of them would be feasible, but many would not. And it was hard to um, sort of not, I don't want to say reject the unrealistic ideas because I didn't want to. Uh, how to work around it. Work it was how, to, how, to, how to work around it without hurting other people's creativity. Because although some idea may be abstract, it may not be realistic with our, with our resources, it could stem other great ideas. So trying to balance the dichotomy of um, success in this short time period of frame versus creativity and what what can we possibly do. So after a fair amount of negotiation and talks, we uh, we ended up deciding to do a project to honor veterans and highlight the armory on on Purdue's campus. The armory has an incredible tradition in that uh, until I believe it was 1964, everyone was required to either be an ROTC or the band. So... uh, the history of the people who have gone through ROTC training in that building, some of the uh, alums who have trained in that building, and very little people, very few people truly know what the armory even is. You they may, you may, you, you may, you know it's an old building. But you don't know what goes on in there. You think there's basketball games in there or something. You know, you may go in there for an intramural hockey game. That's about the only reason you go in there. And or you line up for commencement people. Exactly, you line up for commencement as well. Uh, right. uh, so we thought that's. But there's two two benefits of doing some sort of project outside of the armory. One is highlighting the building and its history. The second is honoring veterans, something that we don't really see much on Purdue's campus. Uh, you see other schools with a little bit more importance on that. And there is a large military history to the university. And obviously, you want to honor veterans, honor freedom. Um, so we came to the conclusion to do this project that we call Freedom Square. And what Freedom Square is... It's essentially a walkway to the to the front doors of the armory coming from the corner of 3rd Street. And so it's a diagonal walkway to the armory, and it has two big pillars in the front, brick pillars, say Freedom Square and limestone, and, and, and sketched in limestone. And the walkway has a 
large pentagon-shaped pedestal in the middle with the American flag. They'll be lit up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and in that, there'll be the crests of the five service branches, as well as a quote um, talking about how freedom is attained through leadership, education, service, dedication, w one or two other things. I can't remember the exact details of the quote off the top of my head. But um, currently, the flag is not lit up and is kind of hidden by a tree. I, I would never. Is it in place at the moment? No, the, the project will con begin construction over this summer. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the current flag outside the armory is hidden by a tree, has to come down every day at 5 p.m. So we thought this is just a very simple way to have the flag flying at all times, um, sort of instill the idea of freedom in people and create a – we didn't really want to say memorial. That's a term I've used a lot, but it's really more of a celebration, a celebration of freedom, a meeting place, a place where students will walk by. It will draw more traffic to the armory and just kind of bring that – bring instill a little bit of pride in everyone who walks by. So – now that we have that idea set, we've been going through the fundraising process, getting uh, with monetary and material donations, and we're almost done with the fundraising. We have a little bit further to go, but uh, we're set to break ground in July this year, this summer, and the goal is to have, have it done by September 11th next year, which will be the 10th anniversary of September 11th, and if that doesn't work, then it'll be by homecoming next year um, for some sort of dedication ceremony. Very nice. Yeah. Well, they're talking about the student corridor. Is that going to be on third? Yes, the, that's so, so that'll that is third. So that'll work right. Exactly. Nicely. We we met with the campus architects, okay. and they were able to show us Purdue University's master plan because we had a few things, and that we wanted to make sure whatever our project was, if it's a physical space, that it's it's safe. There's not going to be a new building going up there anytime soon, or uh, you know, there's no no major Fair changes enough. to that area. Okay. And what we did learn was that Third Street going to the west towards where the Korak and Earhart Dining Hall says that it will be a student corridor, and that's where they expect the majority of student uh, student transportation to occur, or walking there transportation. And yes, and there'll be the new Student for Success and Excellence Center there, so it'll be a big bigger for student leaders and for students to walk back and forth, and it'll really highlight that walking Super. corridor, I believe. How, how does the fundraising go about? Do you work with the advancement of the university's advancement office on that? Yes, we, okay. we've been working directly with the director of development for the student services group. So okay. the development office has different points of contact throughout different schools. And uh, so we've been working with Annette Lamb, the student services group, and she's been incredibly helpful. And we've really just been kind of been targeting Iron, Iron Key alumni, people who are involved in ROTC at their point in time, and almost simply patriotic individuals. You know, there's no list of patriotic individuals the university has, but any village who kind of who see who see see the benefits and of this and get excited about the program. Too, you know? Exactly. And that was I, I had essentially no fundraising experience. I'd done little tiny things to help out, but never led a major project such as this. And that's one thing that we learned was you know setting up a meeting in which you don't ask for a five hundred dollar donation. You instead ask for a name of. 50 people who may be interested in donating, and then, then there is that large word-of-mouth connection. Very nice. Yeah. Did you do any specific fundraisers at all, like some of the people have? Did you do a, any events like that? Or? Well, we did not, and okay. uh, the reason for that is, I probably should have mentioned this in the description of Iron Key, is it's a secret organization. Okay. okay. So no one knows who the 12 members are. And, and, that, that, that's, and that's the total number, they stay at 12? Yes, okay. yep. so stays at 12. Um, and then there's also four honoraries or advisors, so faculty members who have shown and a great Tony dedication. Tony Hawkins is your advisor. Yes, Tony Hawkins is, is the advisor, is the, the group advisor, former dean of students, and he just recently transitioned to his new role yeah. of associate vice president for student services. Um, so that, that the, the whole purpose of the group is to improve Purdue's campus without recognition. So there's no there's no agen hidden agendas within the group. No one knows you're doing this um, until the thing is finalized. And yeah, until the final thing is finalized, and then even then we'll announce what the project is, who did it. But it's not it's not as if we give a press release with all 12 individuals' names, yeah. so, you know, so we can walk around campus cheering. It's very, it, must have, it takes quite a while to come up with that because there are some. There are a lot of things around here, that, and it's sort of hard to, to kind of get something sort of unique. Mm -hmm. But the armory is a building that has been there for a long time, and now that they don't have, as you say, the mandatory ROTC mm -hmm. and things, and people walk by it all the time. Absolutely. You walk by it all the time. Um, little little foot traffic actually to the building. You walk sure. on the outside all the time. And espe an especially without the flag flying out front, you would really have no clue what, what that That's building right. holds. Yeah. This will be a nice thing for you to 
tell your children about it. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully it'll still be there when my children are around someday, so we can go see it. <laughs> um, what about uh, leadership? The uh, thoughts on leadership in academe and in the professional world. Sure. Um, leadership's incredibly important to me. Um, you know, I don't don't necessarily know if I have my own definition of leadership or anything of that sort, but I think a good leader can motivate people to get more out of themselves than they would be able to do otherwise. So sort of making the group greater than the sum of its parts. I think that's what a good leader does, and I think it's very important because without a leader, there's no true direction. Um, I've seen that in student organizations. I've seen that through faculty, uh, especially now with the Cranet School of Management. It's fallen on a couple tough times in the past year or two in rankings and seeing a faculty take leadership roles to implement changes to improve that has been really interesting. And I've had some very good work experience outside of Purdue as well um, through different summer internships and now being here for a full four years. Um, I've been able to leave for a couple summers and work and l- seeing the exact same leadership effect in the business world applies as well. Um, having that sense of direction, having that vision uh, is incredibly important. And I think it's truly hard to effectively communicate that vision, that sense of direction. So I think that that defines a good leader as giving that sense of direction and then motivating people to get there more than they would on their own. All right, very good. Um, uh, do you feel that uh, certainly your experience in high school helped a lot, just some, gave you some direction, some focus? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it did. I yeah. think the specifically on the soccer field, it's what helped just sort of instill the idea of hard work and what the what a leader really does, uh, that's kind of where I learned that uh, you know, a leader shouldn't ask you to do what they're not willing to do, and uh, you know what true character is, and things of that sort. But it was really more at Purdue University that I learned how to apply those leadership skills. So I may have learned what kind of what a le- what a leader's supposed to look like, what they're supposed to do, but I'd never really I'm sure. I, I, you know, I was captain of a team at one point, but I'd never really. Uh, Applied it in a in a, in a more professional and more professional manner, and that was one of the greatest takeaways from my university career. I attribute a lot of that to Sigma Chi fraternity. Learned uh, in, quickly learned leadership roles with within my freshman year there. Yeah, very good. Let's talk a little bit about some hobbies, but then uh, for the researchers, tell them about the project, so what you did over spring break. Sure, absolutely. And your, uh, what's your major? Uh, what are you focusing in in Granard? Sure, so, I'm a it's currently second year MBA student concentrating in finance and strategy uh, okay. pr- mainly finance but yes okay okay so talk about the project that uh, the competition in germany sure so this past month i was able to travel to germany for a case competition and it was an international case competition in which 24 teams with students from 30 different countries participated in so there were only two teams from the u.s participating us from four four craner students and a team for University of North Carolina was also attending. So we were the two U.S. Represent- representatives. And it was a business case competition in which we, it was a sort of single elimination competition by round. So there was four rounds in which you were giving, given a, a case of some sort. Uh, so, for example, the first case is one in which the company, a company very similar to AAA, came in. And it's basically AAA's version of Germany, and they. And the, I'm sorry, I should have should back for, backtrack a little bit. The, the theme of the competition is around mobility, the future of mobility. How will people get around? How will they do it in an, in an environmentally friendly manner? And uh, so, for example, the first company that came in spoke to us. They're basically the AAA of Germany, and they spoke to us about how the methods of our service our services are changing with our customers needs what do you where do you expect us to be in 10 or 15 years and it's sort of the short to medium term future and we were able to give recommendations on that project and um, from there if you were to advance you or you had about three hours to come up with a recommendation give a presentation and then they would pick pick three teams out of four to advance and there's four rounds of those the companies that presented were the AAA of Germany DHL uh, Siemens and then the final final round was f- your university was basically your project. So our final round is with Purdue University, and we were actually we were lucky enough to win the competition. So that was exciting as well. So out of twenty four teams in thirty countries, Purdue University and the Cranach students were were the sole winners. And it was neat being able to present in front of a 
very large audience of people from so many different countries and you know kind of and be led in by the American flag that was something that was very neat and uh, especially since the last project was about our university I or I gave sort of the opening pitch about the university and being able to explain the history how our campus is set up the highlights of Purdue but it was very neat as well Super. What do you get a plaque, or what? What does you get as being the winner? The prize. The prize was actually an iPad. So uh, super. Brought that home. Um, and I opened it up at home and realized it has a German charger. So I haven't been able to use it that much yet. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's a great. It's local, gift. right? <laughs> yeah. Barrett, congratulations. Thank That's you. Wonderful. Any other special hobbies that you have that you'd like to share with us? You know, nothing. Nothing okay. too special. The things I have always done in my life and in my, especially my college career now are outdoor activities. So I love running, hiking, mountain biking, that, that sort of thing is sort of what keeps me sane and always, always try to do as much physical stuff active as I can. There's a challenge right? Exactly. Yeah, uh, Purdue tradition. Favorite Purdue tradition? Yeah. I would say uh, football games and in, cor- and, and, and in coordination with that, uh, the Purdue fight song. <laughs> Seeing uh, different I, well, I've all I've grown up a diehard Purdue football fan, so I just love uh, love going to the games. Got it was a, I lived just in at my fraternity. I lived with a couple of guys on the team, so getting able to cheer them on as well, and uh, you know, spend the majority of my time with them. Uh, and then the, I say a coordination with the fight song as well, because that's where you see the passion on people's face and the tradition of the university, and just yeah. you know, be standing next to a. Whether it's a six-year-old kid who, uh, who knows very little about Purdue, but his dad taught him the fight song, or a 86-year-old man who's singing the fight song, and see that passion, that pride for the university. Uh, so that, that I'd say that is my favorite tradition. I agree with you. That's very really nice. Outstanding event. Outstanding event. Maybe the most recent one is Sarah yeah. Cooper. Yeah, yeah. The, the the I guess for non-Purdue memory, um, maybe this case competition in which we were able to compete compete in just this past month in Germany. Outside of the, my favorite on-campus event that I've been able to participate in, I'd say is the old master's program. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the group a little bit, but it brings 10 distinguished alumni or people somehow connected to the university back to campus for a period of three days and really in, integrate with students completely. And I was a part of the program for two years, once as a host and once as a uh, or sort of the, on the organizing committee of the group, Old Master Central Committee. And when I was a host, I would say that was the most fun three days I've had at Purdue in a, in a, for a continuous stretch, I should say. Who was the person you were hosting, do you recall? Yes, I was hosting Glenn Campbell. I absolutely remember. Or no, it's a different. There are all these two Glenn Campbells. Oh, so, not the singer. Not the singer, oh, okay. no. Because I, I, I'd be surprised if you knew this Glenn Campbell off the top of your head. No. Uh, this Glenn Campbell was the founder of Hat World and Lids, the store. So... Um, it's one of the bigger retailers in the country, okay. recently owned by Genesco, but he's not a Purdue alum. His wife went to Purdue University, and he opened up the very first Hat World store in the Tip Canoe County Mall. So he's very... Oh, that's the hat shop? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. So, okay. I mean, I think there's there's well over a thousand stores now all over the world. They had one. I used to see one in the uh, Indianapolis Airport. Yep. In the old one. Okay. Yep. There's yeah. one in the Indianapolis Airport. There yeah. was one on campus, and that one didn't do too well, so the one on campus is now closed, but... Um, so he was he was my guest or my my old master if you will and he was phenomenal he loved absolutely loved every minute of it we loved every minute of it as well and I was able to establish a great relationship with him and so I'm going to try to keep, still keep in touch keep with him keep in touch with him right okay uh, the next stage post Purdue post Purdue right uh, I'll be graduating in May and I'll have a little over a month and a half off and then I'll move to Minneapolis Minnesota where I'll work for General Mills in a finance role good that's yeah. very very nice. That's good. Anything I forgot to ask, or anything that you would like to close on? You look um, like you're going to be coming back and be in touch. Yeah. Yeah, I hope okay. I hope to. Um, I, yeah, no, nothing. Well, um, you you start this summer then. You yes, I start this summer. Very good. Yeah, so it'll be a little interesting being away from, away from the university and uh, you know, all my We're friends here and all that, but. Be, be ready to move on, I guess. All right, okay. Thank you very much. I well, thank you. It. Thanks. Uh, you know, I share. So this is an addendum to the interview with Tom Trackman. He's going to talk about going down to New Orleans. Yeah, sure. Good. Yeah, in a sort of a brief follow-up conversation, we yeah. told more football stories and mentioned perhaps when another one of the more neat experiences I've had in my Purdue career is traveling to New Orleans with 
large group of members of my fraternity to volunteer for the, with the Drew Brees Dream Foundation and Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Drew Brees is Sigma Chi here at Purdue, obviously, and he set up a set up a group that tries to bring 100 Sigma Chi's from across the country down to New Orleans for a week and work for Habitat for Humanity. So he would, he basically said, uh, find your transportation there and, and back and we'll take care of everything while you're here. So he was able to um, put us up in a hotel, provide us with meals, and then from about 7 a.m. to 3.34 each day, we'd work on the Habitat site. And he would come out. He'd take. He'd come to dinner with us, and he'd come out to the site and work on site with us as well. So ham, hammering nails, putting up walls, that sort of thing, and, and just learning from him and his leadership was great. As well as speaking to the individuals who are going to live in these homes, uh, the, the hugs, uh, the hugs and gratitude and ex- expressions of gratitude we received from them for dedicating our time in New Orleans was. It was truly overwhelming and you know, a very memorable experience to learn through the devastation they've gone through and sort of realize how blessed you are at the same time. So been able to do that past four years. Uh, I won't be able to go this year, but there will be year five. So I know at least 30 Sigma Chi's or so from Purdue will trek down again, and hopefully this, uh, the foundation will go as long as it can. It's called. It's technically named Rebuilding Through Brotherhood. Rebuilding Through Brotherhood. It's the name of it, and uh, organized by the Drew Brees Dream Foundation. That's it. Um, do you build, did you get a chance just one house when you finish at the top? Are they in the same spot, the ones that were demolished? Is that Yeah, so all, all our work was in the Upper Ninth Ward. So okay. the Lower Ninth Ward is essentially gone, and the Upper Ninth Ward was pretty heavily damaged, but but some infrastructure remains. Your roads are roads are somewhat clear as opposed to weeded over. Um and we've done it on a few. We've worked on a couple different. We've worked on different work sites each year. First year was in a group called in a little area called Musicians Village, and it's become pretty popular. There's a Chevy commercial in which the country singer, a country singer, is down in Musicians Village, and they're showing all the new homes there. And uh, it's kind of become a little little press hotspot. Um, after that, we worked on the Jimmy Carter uh, 25th anniversary project, in which they did 25 houses in a week. So we we're split up between different different projects. And then the past few years, we've been working on much smaller projects where there'd be three or four homes being built at the same, at one time, but we'd be divided up between them. And I think they said, in average, they do a home in about four months. But we would, uh, we're lucky enough to get some great projects in which we'd get the entire frame of a house up, so all the walls up within our within our short time there, or all of a roof up. We've done roofing every year. And then there's also been some times in which we're kind of stuck with doing some side painting jobs or siding of a house as well. But um, we know what the work is very rewarding. Yeah. Are there some of the people going to come back to their homes, do you think? Have some of them come back? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, a, a large percentage of the population is gone and will be gone, um, locked to Houston, Texas area. But the the people who are f- from New Orleans and love the city, they'll be back. Um, to quote Breeze, he all, I think he said this every year, so I definitely remember the quote is, if you love this city, it will love you back. And he, he's very passionate about it. So I think, I think, it's got a, I think the future is going to be better. There's more restaurants open in New Orleans today than there were before Hurricane Katrina. So notice a change. So, you know, it's, and through my four years, I've noticed an incredible change because I went the first sort of spring, first spring or summer after the storm, right. and now four and a half years later, you know, it's, it's a different world down there. Um, so much better. No more. You used to see spray painting on the side of almost every house and building, saying the number of guns found, the number of people dead found, the number of animals found within the home, um, and what task force went through and found that information. And you know that that's gone. You never would have known that was ever there. Um, so I've seen incredible changes. And uh, that's I, nice to see. Yeah. And to experience it and be a part of it. I Absolutely. think that's the neat part. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Tom. That's You're very welcome. nice. Thank you.